Hello friends, welcome back to a new video. Today we will finally be going over my big summer reading wrap up. So we'll be talking about all the books I read in June, July and August. Although we are talking about the books I read over the summer months, I am in the fall spirit. I have my fall mug here. It's fall, y'all. It's my little Snoopy mug. And I am wearing my pumpkin season sweater as well. And I've decorated my bookshelves for fall too, because as soon as September rolled around, I could not help myself. I hate summer with a passion and I'm so excited for the cooler months. So we're talking about my summer wrap up, but we're embracing the fall season. It's also been a very, very long week for me. I really wanted to get this video out the first week of September. That didn't happen. Work has been nuts. <laughs> we're always short staffed, but I mean, welcome to healthcare. That's always the case. Um, so today is a sweater, coffee, and messy bun kind of day. We're just gonna go with it. I do think this will be a longer video. I have a lot of books <laughs> to wrap up. So grab yourselves a snack, a warm drink, whatever makes you feel cozy, and let's talk about all the books I read the last few months. I will organize this video by genre, so I'll talk about each book in its specific genre, but then within each genre I will try to go from my least favorite to my favorite book. I have mentioned in past videos how I'm not really the biggest fan of numerical ratings. I do use them on Goodreads because I find them really helpful, especially when looking back and seeing like which books you know were my favorites of the year and that kind of thing. It helps me keep track of my general feelings towards a book, but going forward I may not always mention like if I gave this book a four star, five star. My feelings run deeper than a number, if that makes any sense. That sounded kind of stupid, but I'm sure you understand what I'm trying to say. I find it convenient to give a book a numerical rating just for Goodreads and keeping track of everything, but I may start kind of veering away from that and focusing more on I guess my deeper thoughts and feelings towards the book. I'm rambling. Let's go ahead and start with the wrap up. And I am going to first mention the three DNFs, which three DNFs for three months is really, really good for me. I'm really happy with that. I've been enjoying the majority of what I've read over the summer and no complaints. Um, the first DNF here, I actually DNF'd it September 1st, but I'm just gonna include it in my summer wrap up because I had started it in August. And that is The Prophet Calls, well, that's a really glary book. The Prophet Calls by Melanie Sumro. And this one is a middle grade book that features like a, a cult. And I have realized I'm not interested in cult books at all. It's just not something that interests me. I also wasn't driving with the writing style. It's first person present tense as well, which is my least favorite narration. So that is the first DNF. I also DNF'd a biblical fiction and that was The Woman from Lydia by Angela Hunt. Angela Hunt is really a hit or miss author for me. I just find her writing style isn't the most consistent. In some of her books, I really enjoyed it and others not so much. And I just could not click with this book. It just, it's not the book for me. And then I also DNF'd a book that I tried for Jane Austen July, and that is Pride and Premeditation. And I DNF'd this one just a few chapters in. It was very, very YA in tone, which is not my favorite thing. And I also didn't like how the author portrayed Jane Austen's beloved characters. So I just found myself irritated with it and decided to set it aside. Alrighty, so let's go over the books that I read throughout the summer. We're going to be starting off with nonfiction and I will be looking down a lot. I have my trusty laptop with a lot of notes because I would not be able to film this video without notes. But the first book is Switch on Your Brain by Caroline Leaf. This is a Christian nonfiction about the brain. It tries to show how neuroscience is supported by biblical truths and biblical principles and how we as imperfect people who struggle with mental health, PTSD, depression, anxiety, all of that, how we can use biblical truths and certain practices to basically heal our brains and rewire our brain. And it delves into epigenetics, it delves into how our brains are neuroplastic, and I thought it had a lot of really, really interesting science to back up the claims that the author was trying to make. There were definitely some good things. I found a lot of the research to be really interesting, but as I was reading, I just, I lost interest. It felt very repetitive. It was the same kind of science repeated over and over and over again. And so by the time you get to the end of the book, which features this brain detox, it's like a 21 day brain detox. I just felt like it was a lot of the same material regurgitated, the same material, but being presented in slightly different ways. Some of the time I found that the author used scripture, but it was taken out of context. Just overall, I thought it was interesting. There were many parts of the book that I actually found helpful and very applicable. And then there were other aspects of the book that just didn't quite work for me. So I, it's like a middle of the road kind of 
nonfiction. If you've read this book, I am really interested to hear your thoughts on it. I could definitely feel the author's passion behind the book. I could feel it so strongly. And I do think, again, there's a lot of wisdom in it. And I will definitely refer back to it in certain moments in my life where I feel it's, you know, appropriate to. I think it was a good book, but not perfect by any means. And it's kind of the reason why I stay away from self-help books and especially Christian self-help books, but I'm just rambling at this point. It was a good book. It wasn't great. I enjoyed parts of it, other parts not so much. There we have it. The other nonfiction that I read, I read for Jane Austen July, and that is Jane Austen at Home by Lucy Worsley. And I really like the little blurb there at the top. Um, it says, Worsley offers as much that Jane Austen's admirers wish to know, with humor and poignancy and common sense, just as Jane would have wished. I honestly don't have too much to share about this biography. I really liked learning more about Jane's family and what life was like throughout her lifetime, the different places she was able to call home. I did really enjoy all the little details that uh, Lucy Worsley presented in this book. I do feel that the author was very much, I don't know if gatekeeping is the right term for it, but it's like she presented Jane in a way like this is Jane. This is who Jane was. There isn't much room for a different perspective. Like this is who Jane is. You got to believe what she says in this book about Jane. It is a biography. Every single author is going to have a bias. It's just, it is what it is. I do think her research was really well done and I really, really enjoyed this book. I just don't think it's the perfect biography by any means, but I do think it is a must for Jane Austen lovers. All right, we'll be moving on to fantasy and I do have three books for this genre. So the first one is Voyage of the Dawn Treader by C.S. Lewis. In this one, we have Edmund and Lucy. The other two siblings are off doing their own thing. I think Peter was studying in school. Susan was in a different country. So Edmund and Lucy go and visit their cousin Eustace and he, wow, that child. <laughs> extremely annoying, extremely immature, and everything that he experienced in this book, he had it coming. Oh my goodness, this child. So Eustace's mom has a painting of a ship and it looks very Narnian. And then all of a sudden the three kids are transported through the picture and they're on the ship. And the story goes from there. There is this huge adventure. They meet Prince Caspian on board and he's on this mission to find these seven lords of Narnia. Eustace learns some very important lessons along the way, which I really enjoyed. I love his story arc and how you know, he experienced his own character growth. I really enjoyed that. So I'm just gonna blame my mood on the fact that this wasn't like a perfect read for me because I have been really enjoying the Chronicles of Narnia, but this one just wasn't a favorite. And I think if I reread it, I would enjoy it a lot more as usually happens with stories like this, but I did enjoy it. I just didn't love it the way I wanted to. And the other two fantasy books I have here are a duology and I did talk about them in my recent book haul and I mentioned how much I adored these books. And I'm talking about The Soul Mark by J.J. Fisher and the second book is Carver of Souls. And oh my goodness, I adored these books so much so much and I still think about them. I read them in June and oh my goodness I just these were amazing. So we'll start off with The Soul Mark and I just don't even know where to start. <laughs> this book was so good but we have our main character Sayla and she's basically sentenced to death for accidentally murdering a nobleman. She is offered an escape though from death if she agrees to be stripped of her soul and sent to this prison island called Azazel. It's an awful place to live. It's basically full of criminals as well as firstborn children of the lot. And what the lot is, basically every year, one firstborn child is chosen to be stripped of their soul and sent to this prison island to atone for the sins of their families and everyone else that lives on the mainland. She takes that route. She is sent to this prison island, obviously to escape death. She also sees this as an opportunity to look for her sister who um, was sent to Azazel. Uh, because she was chosen by the lot as well. And then we also have Caleb who is part of this priesthood. It's called the Righteous and they serve the Carver who is the god in this world. He is a very zealous young man. He's very very eager to please both the Carver and his superiors and he's actually sent to this prison island on a mission basically by the priesthood and he meets Sela along the way and so they meet and they're both dealing with their own past, their own struggles. Sela is struggling with her past Caleb, he's really struggling to understand the carver and to reconcile what he's been told by the priesthood, everything he's learned as compared to what he knows to be truth and what he's read in their version of the Bible, which is the Book of Souls. He believes the carver is loving and merciful, but is struggling to understand how that could be true based on everything that's going on around him. I loved the allegorical elements and allegory does not always work for me. I'm not always a fan 
especially Christian allegory. Sometimes it's really heavy handed. And even though it kind of was heavy handed in this book, I just thought it was perfectly done. It was so, so well done. There's some political intrigue as well. And it seems like war may be on the horizon between this prison island and the old town or the mainland. And on the prison island, we have one of the worst villains I've ever read in a book, but he was so, so well portrayed in this book. His name is Uriah and he was awful, like awful, awful, awful. I love Selah. She's like a firecracker and Caleb as well. He's so sincere and just wanting to know the truth. Every single character in this book was written so uniquely with flaws, but virtues as well. Many, many layers to all of them. I really like the setting as well. It felt like 1700s historical with a little bit of Victorian vibes and there are pirates and gunslinging. This is also a great summer read because the prison island that it's set on, it's very, very tropical and I just thought it was perfect for the summer months. So book one ended on the biggest cliffhanger. <laughs> and I needed to jump right into book two and I did and that is Carver of Souls and I thought this one was even better than the first book. We have more of the pirates and sailing the seas and the evil villain that is Uriah. We see a lot more of him as well. I'm really sorry about the noise. Someone decided that right now is the perfect time to mow their lawn so we're just gonna have to deal with it but like I was saying these two books were just amazing. Something I really, really appreciated about this author is the way that she discussed sin. Nothing was sugarcoated and she really went there with certain themes. The first book does start with the characters as older teens, but throughout the book they obviously they grow and I would say this is more of a new adult to adult kind of duology. They could definitely be enjoyed by the YA audience, but I like that it wasn't written in a way that felt YA. And I mentioned that the author did not sugarcoat anything. She really went there with themes of murder, prostitution. And in the second book, there is a scene where it's implied that a character was raped. I did need to mention that if that is a trigger for you. Um, but the author handled everything with such grace and I just adored these two books. So the next genre we'll be going over is mystery and we're starting off with Murder at Mallowin Hall by Colleen Cambridge. This is the first book in the Philida Bright mystery series. I am just going to read the Goodreads summary because I don't remember anything about it really. It says the author's charming and inventive new historical series introduces an unforgettable heroine in Philida Bright, a fictional housekeeper for none other than famed mystery novelist Agatha Christie. When a dead body is found during a house party at the home of Agatha Christie and her husband, Max Mallowin, it's up to famous author's head of household, Philida Bright, to investigate. I did really like Philida as a main character. Now that I read the summary, I'm actually remembering bits of the story. And I do remember that the actual mystery and where it went, I did not like it at all. So this was not a favorite. I'm not going to continue the series, but I do think it was really well written. And the fact that it was also set in Agatha Christie's house, I found that very fun. And she was definitely present throughout the story. It was a decent read. I just don't have any desire to continue the series. The next book is The Elusive Mrs. Polifax by Dorothy Gilman. It's not really a mystery, but I just put it in this category. It's more of a spy thriller. This one was not my favorite out of the three that I have read. I definitely liked the first two more, but I still really, really enjoyed this book. I'm just going to read a little blurb on the back. It says, if you make it across the border, get us help. Some of us care. Do you understand? The arrests grow insane. At the very hour this message is en route to the CIA, Mrs. Polifax is waiting for her night-blooming Sirius flower to do its thing. She hardly gets to see its flowers, though, before being whisked off for another daring mission halfway across the world. If you don't know anything about the series, Mrs. Polifax is a woman in her 60s, and she's just this older woman living her retirement years until she finds herself a courier for the CIA. And in this book, she's sent to communist Bulgaria on a mission and... What should be a very straightforward mission, of course, is not straightforward. And so she meets some very interesting people. She is whisked away on this adventure and it's just so, so much fun. I love a couple of the side characters in this book. We have Tsanko and Debbie. They're two of my favorite characters as well. Even though this was not a perfect book for me, and I, like I said, I preferred the first two books, I still really, really enjoyed this one. And Dorothy Gilman is just so, so good at transporting you to the different places that she sets her book in the different countries. I felt like I was in 
Bulgaria with Mrs. Polifax. And even though I don't think every single book in the series will be like that perfect five star read, it is a five star series in my books. I am really, really enjoying my time with Mrs. Polifax and I'm so excited to continue the series. All right, and the next book, it isn't really a mystery, but I had really nowhere else to put it. And that is These Silent Woods by Kimmy Cunningham Grant. I really, really enjoyed this one. And I'm actually going to read the summary. Um, I think it is perfect to describe the book without giving too much away. It says, No electricity, no family, no connection to the outside world. For eight years, Cooper and his young daughter, Finch, have lived in isolation in a remote cabin in the northern Appalachian woods. And that's exactly the way Cooper wants it, because he's got a lot to hide. Finch has been raised on the books filling the cabin's shelves and the beautiful but brutal code of life in the wilderness. But she's starting to push back against the sheltered life Cooper has created for her, and he's still haunted by the painful truth of what it took to get them there. The only people who know they exist are a mysterious local hermit named Scotland and Cooper's old friend Jake, who visits each winter to bring them food and supplies. But this year, Jake doesn't show up, setting off an irreversible chain of events that reveals just how precarious their situation really is. Suddenly, the boundaries of their safe haven have been blurred, and when a stranger wanders into their woods, Finch's growing obsession with her could put them all in danger. After a shocking disappearance threatens to upend the only life Finch has ever known, Cooper is forced to decide whether to keep hiding or finally face the sins of his past. This book was so, so good. It's more of a survival story. It did have a touch of the thriller as well, but the two characters are what made the story just shine for me. Finch was adorable. Cooper, he was also a fascinating character. Obviously with things that he's hiding, it was not at all what I expected. And I'm so glad that's the case because it made for a very, very enjoyable read. And I loved the ending. It also brought tears to my eyes. It was such a good book. I would highly recommend it. Unfortunately, at the very bottom for classics is Kristen Lovren's Daughter by Sigrid Unset. It is a volume of three separate books that are The Wreath, The Wife, and The Cross. And I buddy read all three throughout June, July, and August with a few lovely ladies. And I believe for the most part, we all felt similarly about the book. It says, as a young girl growing up in 14th century Norway, Kristen is deeply devoted to her father, a kind and courageous man. But when, as a student in a convent school, she meets the charming and impetuous Erland, she defies her parents in stubborn pursuit of her own desires. I don't think you should know anything else about this before you read it. It's really, really heavy, so I'm not going to keep holding it up. But like I read from the summary of the book, we do have Kristen, who is our main character, and the first book, she's a child, and then in books two and three, she grows into her adulthood. The first book was probably my favorite of the three. It has a bit of that coming of age aspect to it, and... Kristen. She's very close to her father, like it said in the summary, and I really, really loved her father as a character. He was wonderful. And I liked Kristen as a child as well. She was very endearing. There are some really, really interesting themes in this book, like the sins of the parents and the consequences falling on the next generation, generational curses, sin, selfishness, rebellion, that kind of thing. And I really appreciated the way that the author explored them, especially in this setting of medieval Norway, where we have the Catholic Church, which is very predominant in this time. But we also have these characters still holding on to a lot of their pagan roots and a lot of superstition and how those two things kind of collide. I loved seeing how people reconciled their faith with things that, you know, have been passed on through the generations, all the superstition and all of that. The writing was beautiful. The nature descriptions were gorgeous. So many phrases and paragraphs that I underlined. I do think this book is worthwhile. I think it is a pretty powerful story in a way, but because of who I am as a reader and my own preferences and what I like to read, I liked it and I really appreciated it and appreciated different aspects of it, but I didn't love the book. I felt very, very heavy in my soul after I finished it. It was a very intense read, especially books two and three. I do not mind reading about characters that make really bad decisions and they're infuriating and you just wanna shake them. I've enjoyed a lot of books with characters like that, but it just, it was too much for me in the second and third book. Every single character, I literally wanted to line them up and just shake them so they could come back to their senses. I was just feeling too many negative emotions while reading it. It was too much for me. The characters were exasperating. The pacing of the second and third book was also a lot slower than the first book. I liked it. I would reread it in the future. I just have to be in the right headspace for it. And I know that I will be thinking about it for a long time. Definitely not thinking about it positively, but I do know it will stick with me throughout the next however many years, but... Anyways, that was Kristen Lavern's daughter, an intense read for sure.
this next book, I actually feel so, so sad about it. <sighs> Mansfield Park. I love Jane Austen. I, I truly, truly do. I love Jane Austen. The first time I read this book several years ago, I really liked it. I really need to just listen to my mood. If I'm not in the mood for a book, I need to just put it down because I made the mistake of pushing through this because it was Jane Austen July and I really, really wanted to reread it. And I was so, so bored throughout the entire thing to the point where I could not focus on the beauty of Jane Austen's writing. I couldn't pick up on the wonderful themes that she explores in her books. I was just pushing through it for the sake of finishing it and I regret it. I know that when I'm in the mood for this, I will enjoy it. I will love it. But I just, I, yeah, I was really, really foolish <laughs> reading this book in July. I do think Fanny's wonderful. She's a great character. She goes through an amazing, amazing character arc. There are some other really great characters. I really like Mary and Henry Crawford, not because they're great people, but I really liked them as characters. One thing I will say is I don't think I'll ever understand people who like the fact that, and this is a spoiler, if you have not read Mansfield Park and you really want to read Mansfield Park, this is a spoiler, I'm just warning you now, but I think Edmund is actually really dumb. I think he's very thick in the head and I don't like that he and Fanny ended up together. She deserves better. I know this is not a popular opinion. I'm so sorry for those who love Edmund, but for him, it was all Mary Crawford, Mary this, Mary that. And then as soon as Mary is finished with him, then it's, oh, Fanny, Fanny, you're so beautiful. I don't like Edmund at all. <laughs> I was also in a huge, huge reading slump in July. I was just struggling to enjoy reading, period. So one day I will reread this and I will have much more positive thoughts. <laughs> it just was not the time. I, I should not have read this, but either way, Fanny's great. Just, I don't know, it was a struggle. <laughs> Alrighty, the rest of the classics were all very, very enjoyable. This next one is Miss Bunkle's Book by D.E. Stevenson. It wasn't a perfect read, but I did really, really enjoy my time with it. And I believe it is set in the summertime. So this one was a really good summer read as well. From what I remember, it was set in summer. There was lots of dry, tongue-in-cheek British humor, which made it very fun. So we have Barbara Bunkle, who is in need of money, and she decides to write a book. She writes it under the pseudonym of John Smith, and she bases the story on her village that she lives in and all of its inhabitants. She is not expecting it to be a bestseller, but a bestseller this book is. Some of her neighbors start reading the book and they're all noticing that things in the story are lining up with what's actually going on in this village. And the characters seem to have, you know, their matching character in this book. Real life really starts to mimic this fictional story. And even though the book is a financial blessing for Miss Bunkle, she does have to deal with some repercussions as well. And then I just have a little note here of my favorite characters. So we have Mr. Abbott, who was Miss Bunkle's publisher, and he was so, so endearing. Miss Greensleeves, she was insufferable, but very, very entertaining. And then I also loved Dr. Walker and his wife, Sarah. They were so sweet. And Sarah as a mother was also so beautiful. And there's actually a scene here that I wanted to read. Um, it's just really sweet and I really liked it. You don't mean to say you waited up, Dr. John exclaimed, filling the doorway of the study with his huge bulk. He was half annoyed with her for disobeying orders and wholly pleased to find a smiling and wide awake Sarah. Was he a tired, cold boy then? She inquired, twining her arms around his neck and kissing the wrinkles at the corners of his eyes. He was rather, admitted John Walker, laughing, but strange to say he felt all at once much less tired and quite warm and comfortable. He sat down by the fire, which, thanks to Sarah's care, was full of leaping, warming, cheering flames and listened to her light footsteps going down the passage to warm his, I think his bengers, for him. What a blessed darling she was, thought Dr. John, and how lucky he was and how unworthy of her dear warm love. There had been a time after the twins were born when he thought he might lose her. She seemed to be going downhill, down, 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 and nothing that he could do or think of seemed to stop that steady decline. Not prayer, nor cod liver oil, nor iron injections had seemed of the slightest avail, and he knew only too well where that hill ended. And then, quite suddenly, and for no reason that he could see, she had begun to climb up again, and here she was, still with him, still spoiling him, still making him love her more and more and more every day. 
I just thought that was so sweet. I really, really liked that passage. And then I also really enjoyed seeing Mrs. Featherstone Hogg, who is this snotty woman, gives herself airs, and she is determined to find out who John Smith is, the author of the book. It was a really fun story. I really liked Miss Bunkle especially. No one really thinks of her as a deep thinker or the type to be a successful novelist. And the publisher, he actually kind of portrayed that idea that Miss Bunkle doesn't seem the type to be a good writer. It says here, it was curious, Mr. Abbott thought, that a woman who could write good English should be unable to speak it. He had noticed this little peculiarity of Miss Bunkle's before. It amused and intrigued him. It wasn't like an all time favorite book. I wasn't immersed in the story at all times, but still a really fun read. And I do hope to continue the series as well. We also have Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is not my favorite Elizabeth Gaskell story so far, but I still really, really enjoyed it. I believe it's set in 1840, around there in the fictional town of Cranford and the Industrial Revolution is making its presence known. The railway has also made its grand entrance. We have our main character, Mary, who regularly visits Cranford and we get to see, you know, the small village goings on, the small village gossip. It's basically a town full of older spinsters until a man arrives with his two daughters. Some interesting things definitely happen as a result of this gentleman showing up. I loved Miss Maddie. She was my favorite character in this book. And there were just some beautiful, beautiful emotional moments that I was not expecting. There's lots of humor in this book, but some really deep moments as well. I liked that it was also episodical. There isn't really an overarching plot. I just thought it was a perfect way of telling this story as it is quite short as well. I really enjoyed that there were women of different social status living in this village. It was a really sweet story. And of course, I adore Elizabeth Gaskell's writing, so that makes it all the better, and I would highly recommend this one. Alrighty, and we have two more classics to talk about. They are both just beautiful perfection, both by the same author. We have The Heir of Redcliffe by Charlotte Mary Young and Dinah Perteris by the same author. I adored these books more than I could even express. So The Heir of Redcliffe, this one actually took me a while to read. I buddy read it with Anne from in Search of Wonder. I'll have her channel linked below. I actually started this March 8th and finished it July 8th. So it was four months on the dot that it took me to read this. But I'm really, really glad I took my time with it. I think for this book, you have to read it slowly. Otherwise, you may find yourself bogged down because the pacing is not the greatest. I'll be completely honest. It does suffer from a very slow moving plot. But I didn't really care because I loved every single moment that I was reading this book. I loved every single moment spent with the characters. The Edmonston family is one of my favorite fictional families of all time. The way that their family was portrayed felt so realistic. The conflict, the sibling dynamics, just everything about it was beautiful. Motherhood was portrayed in such a beautiful way in this book. The Edmonston family actually reminds me a lot of the March family from Little Women. And I do feel Louisa May Alcott was heavily inspired by this book when she wrote Little Women, even though it may not be glaringly obvious. Just little things that I picked up on throughout the reading experience. I'm like, this is so much like Little Women. I love this so much. Little Women is my favorite book of all time. So that made this an even better read because of that. In Little Women, Jo March is actually reading this book and there is a very specific scene that makes her cry and it made me cry too. So I completely understand. And from now on, when I reread Little Women, I'll understand what she is referring to. I did want to read the first paragraph as it introduces us to the home of the Edmonston family. It's called Hollywell House. And I just, it's so cozy. I love it so much. It says, the drawing room of Hollywell House was one of the favorite apartments where a peculiar air of home seemed to reside. Whether seen in the middle of summer, all its large windows open to the garden, or as when our story commences, its bright fire and stands of fragrant greenhouse plants contrasted with the wintry fog and leafless trees of November. There were two persons in the room, a young lady who sat drawing at the round table and a youth lying on a couch near the fire surrounded with books and newspapers and a pair of crutches near him. And then we are introduced to the Edmonston family and their cousin Philip. And then we're also introduced to Guy Morville, who is the heir of Redcliffe as his grandfather passed away and he inherits this home, but he's not of age yet. So he is taken under the guardianship of Mrs. Edmonston and her husband as he is a distant relative. I love how Mrs. Edmonston becomes like a surrogate mother for Guy. It was just so beautiful and she's such a good mother. The main conflict of this book is between Philip and Guy, the two cousins of the, of the Edmonston family. There's an ancient family feud that has spanned generations and generations that affects how Philip and Guy interact with each other. And Philip was one of the most interesting, I would call him a villain, but he wasn't really a villain. I mean, I guess he is the, the antagonist of the novel, but he's so manipulative. I don't think he even realizes just how manipulative he is and how awful he is towards 
Guy. And then Guy, even though he is a great character and a wonderful person, he's not perfect. He is constantly fighting with his temper and his tendency to speak before he thinks. And so Guy and Philip, they don't really get along and all the Edmonston siblings are affected by their rivalry. And I really like the descriptions of Redcliffe, the home that Guy is, you know, inheriting. It feels very gothic and like there's like a ghostly presence and I really really liked that. The only Edmonston sibling that I didn't really like was Laura and I can't say too much without spoiling kind of where her story goes but I didn't really like her. I really really liked Amy. She was such a sweetheart. Charlotte was also hilarious and Charles was probably my favorite sibling. He I feel experiences the most growth out of all the Edmonstons and it was just beautiful to see. There were also some beautiful romantic elements and I do not want to say anything because I feel like it will spoil it. You shouldn't know too much about what goes on in the romance department for this book. I will say this book has a lot of religion and moralizing and that may be off-putting to some people but I didn't mind it at all. I thought it was really well done. I didn't feel like I was being hit over the head with it at all. This book had some of the most incredible characters I've ever read and the sibling dynamics were among my absolute top favorite alongside the March sisters of course but this book was perfection. I loved it so much. <laughs> so so much. After I finished The Air of Redcliffe I was invited by some wonderful people that I am friends with on Goodreads to buddy read Dynaver Terrace by Charlotte Mary Young as well and this was another top classic favorite of all time even though i loved the air of redcliffe just as much as this one this one has a much better pacing for the plot it was just perfect the writing is incredible the romantic elements were perfect the characterization for every single character was perfect our main character is louis and he is the son of lord ormersfield and he reminded me a lot of guy from the air of redcliffe i saw a lot of similarities between their characters this felt a little bit like louis coming of age story as well and coming of age stories are not always my favorite thing but i really really liked this one so louis ends up meeting his cousin mary who has recently returned from Peru where she lived there with her mother and father. Her mother's not doing so well with her health and her doctor recommended coming back to England and so she and her daughter Mary come back and stay with Lord Ormesfield. Mary was also such a wonderful character, probably my favorite character in the entire book to be completely honest. And so Mary comes and lives with Louis and his father. And then we also meet Catherine Dynever and a bunch of other characters that live in Dynever Terrace, which is what the book is named after. It was like a I think they're townhomes kind of thing. And she is the mistress of a school for boys as well. I love how she was described as the adopted grandmama of all Northwold, which is the, the town this is set in. She was such a sweet, sweet woman. I really, really liked her character. We're introduced to her servant, Jane Beckett, as well as Charlotte Arnold, who works with Jane. And there's a little bit of that upstairs, downstairs kind of vibe to this book. Not too, too much in the way like Downton Abbey, for example, is, but it, it is present in the book as well. And I really liked Charlotte as a character. She was hilarious. We get to see a little bit of Charlotte's romantic I guess happenings and how things don't go so well for her. Catherine also has a couple of grandchildren James and Clara and they were wonderful characters as well and then we're introduced to another family we have Isabel and her siblings and her mother. The plot really revolves around how these characters interact with each other and the romantic entanglements. We also get to travel to Peru for part of the book and that was really really fascinating. It was such an immersive read the entire time I just could not put this book down. Just like in the era of Redcliffe the author did an amazing job at portraying family relationships between cousins, father and son, Lord Ormersfield and Louis. They had to work through a lot together um, for their relationship and the romantic relationships were even better in this book than in the air of Redcliffe. I just, I adored this so much and I don't know what else to say. My thoughts are scattered. They're all over the place. I'm gushing because it was amazing and every single person who loves Victorian literature, I think, needs to read this book. Alrighty, so those were all the classics I read and we'll now finish off my wrap up with all the historical fiction that I read, starting off with the least favorite of the list. We have Long Way Home by Lynn Austin and I like Lynn Austin. I've read some books by her that I really, really loved and then some that were middle of the road, weren't all time favorites. This one, I liked it. I think on Goodreads, I rounded it up to four, but I said it was like around a three and a half to 3.75. Again, numerical ratings aren't always they don't tell all about my feelings towards a book, but I did like it. I just, there were aspects of it that didn't really work for me, but I will read the summary on the back. It says, Peggy Serrano couldn't wait for her best friend to come home from the war, but the Jimmy Barnett who returns is changed so drastically by his experience as a medic in Europe that he can barely function. 
When he attempts the unthinkable, his parents check him into the VA hospital. Peggy determines to help the Barnetts unravel what might have happened to send their son over the edge. She starts by contacting Jimmy's war buddies, trying to identify the mysterious woman in the photo they find in Jimmy's belongings. Seven years earlier, Gisela Wolf and her family flee Germany aboard the passenger ship, the St. Louis, bound for Havana, Cuba. Gisela meets Sam Shapiro on board and the two fall quickly in love, but the ship is denied safe harbor and sent back to Europe. Thus begins Gisela's perilous journey of exile and survival, made possible only by the kindness and courage of a series of strangers she meets along the way, including one man who will change the course of her life. So this is technically dual timeline, but the events are all like within less than 10 years of each other. So it's during World War II and then the few years after it ends. Our main character, Peggy, she is very close with Jimmy and his family and she's trying to help them because Jimmy, he tries to take his own life. He ends up in the VA hospital and he's obviously suffering from PTSD. And what I really, really enjoyed about this story was the look into what went on in the VA hospitals, how these men were treated and the kinds of treatments that they tried to use for PTSD. And some of it was just so, so awful, so unsettling. I really, really like how the author portrayed all of that. And Peggy was such a loyal friend. So I really appreciated that as well. And there's also a side character in Peggy's timeline named Joe, and I really liked his story. I wish we could have gotten more of him. He was a really, really great character as well. What brought it down for me though was the second timeline set during the war with Gisela and her story. I just thought it was very, very predictable. I'm starting to get a little tired of dual timeline stories in a way, I don't know. It's also because this is Christian fiction and I have been struggling with Christian fiction lately. I feel like every time I pick up a Christian fiction, I know where the story is gonna go. And so I don't really enjoy my time the way that I hope to. Although I didn't connect with every single character, I do like this story and I do think Lynn Austin did a really good job with it. I liked the writing. I really, really appreciated the themes, especially surrounding PTSD and grief. I thought it was so well done as well as struggling with your faith. It was very well portrayed in this book. So I would recommend it, just not an all-time favorite. I also read The Exiles by Christina Baker Klein, and this one was a really heavy read, but a really good one as well. This is set in the Victorian era, I believe, and we have young Evangeline, who is this young British woman. She is thrown into prison for theft and attempted murder, and she's eventually sent on a convict ship to Australia. And so learning about that and how a lot of prisoners from England were sent to like the prison colonies, I guess, of Australia, that was really, really interesting. On board the ship, she meets Hazel, who is another convict sent to Australia. And then we go over to Tasmania, I think it was, um, and we meet Mathena, who was a real Palawa girl. And she was essentially kidnapped and forced to live with the British governor and his wife. And the real story of Mathena is so, so tragic. I ended up going on a rabbit hole of learning about her and it was just so tragic. And so we have these three women and their lives are somehow interwoven and their stories are interwoven. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful book. A really, really gut-wrenching read at times. I did at times find I couldn't connect to every single character, specifically Evangeline. I just felt she was very two-dimensional, but I did really like Hazel's perspective. And we also have a doctor on board the ship named Dr. Dunn. He was a really interesting character as well. Mathena as well, like her story was tragic and very, very captivating, but she as a character wasn't as fleshed out as I was hoping she would be. Another reason this book was not an all-time favorite, there was a romance thrown in towards the end of the story that just didn't fit. There wasn't really any development between the two characters and it just felt thrown in there for convenience and just to add that extra plot element, it just didn't need to be there. But I'm so glad I read this book. It was very educational, very gripping, and I definitely want to read more by Christina Baker Klein. If any of you have a recommendation for where to go to next for her books, please do let me know. I also read Jane in the Year Without a Summer by Stephanie Barron. And this one I really, really enjoyed as well. It's part of a very long series by this author, Jane Austen Mystery Series or something like that. And I'm gonna read the summary for it. It says, May of 1816. Jane Austen is feeling unwell with an uneasy stomach, constant fatigue, rashes, fevers, and aches. She attributes her poor condition to the stress of family burdens, which even the drafting of her latest manuscript about a baronet's daughter nursing a broken heart for a daring naval captain cannot alleviate. Her apothecary recommends a trial of the curative waters at Cheltenham Spa in Gloucestershire. Jane decides to use some of the profits earned from her latest novel, Emma, and treat herself to a period of rest and reflection at the spa in the company of her sister Cassandra. Cheltenham Spa hardly turns out to be the relaxing sojourn that Jane and Cassandra envisaged, however. It is immediately obvious that other boarders at the guest house where the Mrs. Austin are staying have come to Cheltenham with stresses of their own, some of them deadly. 
but perhaps with Jane's interference, a terrible crime might be prevented. And it says that it's set during the year without a summer when, when the eruption of Mount Tambora in the South Pacific caused a volcanic winter that shrouded the entire planet for 16 months. I really, really liked this story. The mystery doesn't really start until quite far into the book, I think almost halfway through where we really get any kind of mysterious element. So we're really just hanging out with Jane and Cassandra and their family members and their nieces especially, which was really fun. I really, really liked the writing. Like this author is very, very good at creating this sense of place. And it just, it was the perfect writing to write a story where Jane Austen is featured. I really, really enjoyed that aspect. I will say though, I was expecting to get more of that, you know, the year without a summer, that whole thing with the climate of the entire world being changed. I had recently listened to an episode in this podcast that I've been listening to about the Victorian era and the episode was talking about the Mount Tambora eruption and how that affected the entire planet for several, several months. And so I was just expecting that there would be more of that in this book, although there wasn't, but that's totally fine. The plot was still really fun. The writing was great and I really enjoyed my time with these characters. The mystery did not go in the direction I was expecting as well, which was really, really fun. So this is a really, really good one. And I do want to read more from the series. I do remember I tried the first book and DNF'd it. So I might try to pick it back up and read the books in order, but there are a few towards the end that I might actually read first because I've heard they're really, really good. So that is Jane and The Year Without a Summer. I would highly recommend. Next up, we have a trilogy here, and that is the Sunrise at Normandy trilogy. The first book here is The Sea Before Us, which was my second favorite in the series. Then we have The Sky Above Us, my absolute favorite. And then the third book is The Land Beneath Us. I loved this trilogy so much. I have read another Sarah Sundin book and it wasn't my favorite, but this trilogy was just wonderful. So in the first book, in the prologue, we have three brothers. We have Wyatt, Adler, and Clay. And they experience a huge, huge tragedy that leads to them being estranged from each other. So in the first book, it's more so about Wyatt and his story. The second book features Adler. And then the third book, we have Clay. I just love how the author explored these three brothers, their stories, what they've gone through, the, the sins of their past. It was just beautiful. So in this one, Wyatt ends up a US naval officer and then he is sent overseas to England and he meets Dorothy, who is a Wren. And she's basically tasked with creating these maps using pictures of Normandy and all of the events of this book. It's basically leading up to D-Day. And so she has a lot of preparation to do, piecing together photos of the beach in Normandy. And I really like what it says here. It says, as the two spend concentrated time together in the pressure cooker of war, their deepening friendship threatens to turn into something more, but both of them have too much to lose to give in to love. The reason this wasn't like a perfect five star read was because it featured a love triangle and I'm not a fan of love triangles all that much. But I will say if a love triangle is to be present, the way it was done in this book, I think it was done right. I do also like how Dorothy and Wyatt were friends. They weren't just out there to get each other. They were actually friends. And I believe the other two books as well, like the dynamics between the two main characters before any romantic elements developed, they were all friendly. They were nice to each other. And I really appreciated that. I really love how the author also explored grief in this story, especially when it comes to Dorothy's father and the grief that he's experiencing after losing, I believe, more than one son throughout the war. There are also several references to popular music at the time. A lot of jazz music, which is my absolute favorite thing. I love all things 1930s, 40s, jazz, just, oh, it was so good. And then we have book two, which was my absolute favorite of the entire trilogy. We have Adler, who is the second brother, and he was my favorite out of the three brothers, hands down. So this one says, numbed by grief and harboring shameful secrets, Lieutenant Adler Paxton ships to England with the US 357th fighter group in 1943. Determined to become an ace pilot, Adler battles the Germans in treacherous dogfights in the skies over France as the Allies struggle for control of the air before the D-Day invasion. And then we have Violet. She wants to be a missionary, but for now she serves in the American Red Cross, arranging entertainment for the men of the 357th and setting up programs for local children. Drawn to the mysterious Adler, she enlists his help with her work and urges him to reconnect with his family after a long estrangement. Despite himself, Adler finds his defenses crumbling when it comes to Violet, but D-Day draws near and secrets can't stay buried forever. I just loved this book. I loved Adler so much and I could actually relate to both him and Violet in very deep ways. And this book dealt with some very, very difficult topics, but it was dealt with with such grace. And oh, I just loved it so much, so, so much. <laughs> And then we have the third book, which is The Land Beneath Us. And I will read the back for this as well. 
It says, in 1943, Private Clay Paxton trains hard with the U.S. Army Rangers at Camp Forest, Tennessee, determined to do his best in the upcoming Allied invasion of France. With his future stolen by his brother's betrayal, Clay has only one thing to live for, fulfilling the recurring dream of his death. Leah Jones works as a librarian at Camp Forest, longing to rise above her orphanage, upbringing, and belong to the community, even as she uses her spare time to search for her real family, the baby sisters she was separated from so long ago. After Clay saves Leah's life from a brutal attack, he saves her virtue with a marriage of convenience. When he ships out to train in England for D-Day, their letters bind them together over the distance. But can a love strong enough to overcome death grow between them before Clay's recurring dream comes true? Although this was my least favorite of the series, I still really, really enjoyed it and appreciated how deep the themes were and how the author explored those themes. These books were just so engaging. World War II stories will always have a special place in my heart, even though I do need some time between reading World War II stories because it can get kind of repetitive. I loved seeing how both Britain and the United States prepared for D-Day through those fighting on land, at sea, and in the sky. I thought it was really, really interesting. The highlight of these books were three brothers and their healing. The start of everything was so brutal. The, the reason that they become estranged was just so emotionally intense and it's a story of their healing and it's just powerful and beautiful. And I would highly, highly recommend this series. We have three more historical fiction to go through and they were all such highlights of my summer. <laughs> truly, truly amazing books. Next up is Arabella by Georgette Hare. And oh my goodness, do I love Georgette Hare and I just need to read more of her books. I've been going through her books so slowly, but she is already becoming a favorite author. I loved this book so much. And so in this one, we have Arabella and she lives in the countryside with her clergyman father and her mother and sisters. Her mother has a friend who lives in London and she is willing to help Arabella, I guess, find a man because they need money and <laughs> Arabella is beautiful. And so their plan is to have Arabella enter society during the London season and catch the eye of some dashing wealthy gentleman. On her way to London though, Arabella's carriage breaks down and she ends up at this hunting lodge and the man that owns it is Mr. Beaumaris or I think in French it's Beaumarie. Um, and she meets him and basically tells him that she is an heiress, even though she is most certainly not. This man goes by Bo and he thinks it's absolutely hilarious. I don't think he really buys that she's an heiress, but he goes along with it. And then people in, in London start hearing that this heiress is coming and she's gonna be at all these balls. And Bo ends up launching her into high society and the story goes from there. And it is just so, so much fun. I really appreciated though that this was deeper than just like a silly romance. And it is set in the Regency era, I forgot to mention. It's technically a classic as well. Georgette Hare wrote this, I think in the 30s or 40s. So, like I was saying, it's a lot deeper than just a silly Regency romance. There's a lot of depth to it. And Arabella is such a wonderful, wonderful character. She has so much kindness in her. And it gets to a point where she's so kind to people of lower classes that it really is off-putting to a lot of the wealthier people around her. And then of course, she and Bo get to know each other more and it's just a beautiful story. I loved it so much. The second last book here is another all-time favorite and that is The Unselected Journals of Emma M. Lyon, Volume 2. And as you can tell, I really, really enjoyed this one. All these tabs are just moments that made me laugh out loud and oh my goodness, it's so fun. I really liked the first book, but I was a little bit taken aback because it was very different. This book is set in a pseudo Victorian era England, and it does feel almost fantastical without actually having fantastical elements per se. It's not really a fantasy, but the world it's set in mimics England in the Victorian era. But Emma M. Lyon is this girl who lives in St. Crispian's in this house, and she lives with her cousin Archibald, who's been preventing her from living to her fullest potential and having access to her money and all of that. She is an orphan. And she is just wanting a simple life where she can read books all day and honestly, goals. <laughs> it's really just her day to day, what she gets up to, the balls she goes to, the characters she interacts with. And it is also epistolary, which I love. I love, love, love epistolary novels. And we also get to learn a little bit more about her mysterious next door neighbor, The Tenant. And he is a very, very interesting character. Kind of dreamy, if I'm not gonna lie. I love how The Tenant is, is described as Byronic and he has a limp and it says, it was what a storm would look like if it took human form. His voice sounded like distant thunder. 
Emma is also dealing with grief as well. So it's not all humor. There is definitely some depth to it as well. And I also shared this on Goodreads right when I started the book. Um, the second page, this part made me laugh out loud. We have Nigel Hawks, who is a vicar and they're talking about Archibald, Emma's cousin. And he says, your cousin is quite proud of the scar you gave him. He has me look at it on every visit, convinced it has become ever worse. And here I was thinking there was a curtain with confession. I answered an embarrassed flush on my cheeks. And that was Emma. Yes, I've had one installed. Your cousin confesses his sins first, and then he confesses yours a much longer list, after which he pushes aside the curtain so I might reassess the scar on his fore forehead. He confesses my what? Have no fear, Miss Lyon. And young Hawks quirked an eyebrow upward. You've become one of my favorite members of the parish. Your sins are simply marvelous. Well, a good morning to you. This book and the series, it's just so funny, so intriguing. You have some questions that kind of pop up and there's some mysterious elements and it's just such a fun time. I highly, highly recommend. Friends, we have one last book to talk about and this was probably my favorite read of the entire summer and that is Born of Gilded Mountains by Amanda Dykes. I buddy read this with the wonderful Anne from In Search of Wonder and we both adored this book so much. I think this one is Amanda Dykes' best work yet and as you can tell, I adored it. <laughs> I find that sometimes the books I love the most are the hardest ones to talk about because my feelings are so deep and I've always struggled to verbalize my feelings. I've always struggled to get my thoughts into words. They're all a jumble in my head, but speaking out coherent sentences about how I feel about a book and what I loved about it, it can be really, really hard sometimes. I will just jumble everything if I try to explain what this book is about, so let me read the back for you. It says, a lost treasure, a riddled quest, the healing power of friendship. Legends are tucked into every fold of the Colorado mountains surrounding the quaint town of Mercy Peak. Where residents are the stuff of tall tales, the peaks are taller still, and a lost treasure has etched mystery into the very terrain. In 1948, when outsider Mercy Windsor arrives after a scandal shatters her gilded world as Hollywood's beloved leading lady, she's determined to forge a new life in obscurity in this time-forgotten Colorado haven. She purchases Wildwood, an abandoned estate with a haunting history, and begins to restore it to its former glory. But as she does, her every move tugs at the threads of the mountain's lore, unearthing what became of her long-lost pen pal Rusty Bright, and the whereabouts of the infamous Galloping Goose railcar number no. 8, which vanished years ago, along with the mailbag it carried, whose contents could change the course of countless lives. Not to mention the fabled treasure that, if found, could right so many wrongs. Among the towering mountains that stand as silent witnesses, the ghosts of the past entangle with the courage of the present to find a place where healing, friendship, and hope can abide amid a world forever changed. Let's first just admire this stunning cover. It is absolutely gorgeous. I want to live there. I want to live in the mountains in a cabin and just read books all day. And also this beautiful map that we are presented with. Oh my goodness, it is stunning. Another reason I loved this book so much is the very unique storytelling. So of course we have regular chapters. What I love is that it has varied elements to it. Like we have a screenplay, which isn't really a screenplay. It's kind of hard to explain without you reading it. We have this Hollywood writer who has like his own notes and were given those in the book as well. Our two main characters are also pen pals, so we have their letters to each other as well when they're young and then as they grow older. I think the reason I adored this book so much was the fact that it didn't really have a romance. There's like a suggestion of a romance potential, but that's not at all what this book is. It's all about friendship and the importance of communication and healing. And one of our characters, Rusty, she also goes through such a, a deep, deep journey of learning to let go and just to allow herself to be happy after everything that she had gone through. Everything about this book was perfect, everything. And actually on Goodreads, I listed everything I loved about it just because I was struggling to write a coherent review with well-organized thoughts. A song that I absolutely adore, and I mentioned earlier in this video that I love vintage music. I love 1930s, 40s jazz. And a song that was heavily featured throughout the story is Dream a Little Dream of Me. It was just beautiful just beautiful, as well as It Is Well With My Soul, which is like my favorite hymn. I love that the terrain is just mountains and mountains and mountain lakes and mountain forests and just, oh my goodness, I was meant to live in the mountains and reading this book just made me believe that even more. I love that it's a mountain small town and I love all the side characters. I love the cozy tight-knit community. I love that our two main characters are pen pals and because I love epistolary novels, I love that this book features letters. I love that our main character, Mercy, is a single woman and this book has nothing to do with romance for her at least and I just loved that so so much. 
I think the biggest theme of this book, though, is healing and restoration, and the author even mentions this Bible verse from Joel 2.25. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. And it's that beautiful theme of God coming in and restoring that which was lost, that which was broken. There's also mining, mining for different metals. We have hidden treasure, riddles, a mystery. Before Mercy comes to this mountain town, she was an actress for silent films so we get a lot of that old Hollywood feel. And then of course, the absolute cherry on top is the stunning writing. This author can write. She's hands down my favorite Christian author, Christian fiction author. And of course, I have to read a bunch of quotes and passages because I can't help myself. So this quote is from Mercy and she is interviewing with the Hollywood reporter. Um, his name is Sudsy McGee. And this is what Mercy says. She says, there is certainly nothing simple about mercy. I come to believe more and more that mercy is the most scandalous scandal of all, and I am a grateful recipient of this gift. If you discover in your scrubbing that my story is one of scandalous mercy, then I suppose I shall count that an honor." And I love that her name is also Mercy. That's just, it's beautiful. I adored Mercy, but I also adored Rusty, her pen pal and her friend. And I love how Rusty says this when she was just 10 years old. Just rip off the bandage, do the hard thing and get it done. And that's courage. You'll think then that you can start living, but the truth is you've been living all along. That's what dad says. So every morning I eat my stupid porridge. That makes me gag. Courage. I love Rusty so much. She just was the sweetest child and her, her journey throughout this book is gorgeous. Here's another quote that made me want to move to the Colorado mountains. Outside, the morning air washed over her like water from a mountain brook, crisp, clean, clear. It was sweet, tinged with the scent of pine, sage, and fresh fallen rain. Another passage from one of the letters between the two girls. Does the maker of those stars think of me? Does he whisper in the night breezes, I love you even when no one else does? I do not know, but it is a thought and it is a hope and I will hold on to it. While I cannot dream, I hope you will. Dream not of me, but for me. Dream for both of us. Dream a beautiful life for yourself and live it, Rusty. Live it so big. One last passage and I promise I will stop. <laughs> it says, they stepped inside what felt like an enchanted forest where the walls had created a world within a world. Winds trapped within had circled in a dance, dispersing seeds over the years where the mists of the river rose and descended, and where the ground responded by releasing from its grip entire carpets of larkspur and alyssum, climbing ivy, sprawling moss, and tucked away patches of snow in the shadowed corner. Even the tangles of weeds had poetry to them here, tap-tapping against the walls and wrapping their ankles as they waded in to find a river at its leisure. A parched riverbed lay beyond it, and in the middle, a series of levees and dikes where Gilman had coaxed the waters from their course and into weaving bands of streams, then released them onto their new home. This book was amazing. Highly recommend. I adored it. I adored the characters. I adored the writing. I adored the story. Everything about it. Everything. It was beautiful. Highly, highly recommend. And that is my very, very long wrap up. I think there are 23 books. That's insane. Thank you to every single one of you who watched this video for however long you watched it. And I'm just so grateful for this community. I appreciate each of you and I'm so grateful that you are here. Thank you so much for watching this video. I will see you all in my next one. Bye.